Hey everyone, it's Clint. Welcome to Sweetcast. I am up super late, so it's a little, a little dark in here maybe uh, with my potato cam. And uh, I have no excuse, but I'm going into Bleeding Cool Unprotected. That's right, so you don't have to uh, talk. This is actually, okay, this is actually really exciting news, I think. And we've all seen this trend happening. Uh, and here we go. This is Bleeding Cool admitting to the same thing. Comic store in your future. There is a comic book back issue boom, or is there rather? Uh, I've heard a lot of people. This is anecdotal evidence when you just hear things uh, that that say it's true, but I think it it is happening to be true, and that is that more and more people are reading back issue. That's because people still love comics. Believe it or not, no matter what they tell you, people love comics. They're fun. There's no other medium that is like comics. Uh, and so here we go. This is a great example, and it is finally people seeing that people are willing to pay for comics that are actually good and that they like. So new comics are struggling, and old comics are actually uh, in, in sort of a boom. Uh, so here we go, reading from Bleeding Cool. Are back issue comics booming? I would say there's a rise as someone that was around as a comic collector in the 1990s. Some comic speculation bust... Uh, or the 1990s comic speculation bus, thank you. I would also say we are nowhere near the level of the 1990s boom or amount of speculation. Yeah, not even not even close, actually, at all. <laughs> In fact, where you're getting small print runs, probably, mark my words, I would believe, I'm going to venture to guess, that a lot of these crowdfunded comic books that have really, relatively speaking, small print runs because they're printed to demand rather than printed in mass quantities and shoved down retailers throats those books are the ones that are going to be worth money down the road uh, because they are limited and because there is a future after you get those books there there's more to come okay so he says which is a good thing i remember reading sports now hold on sorry i gotta i gotta stop here which is a good thing if you weren't into the 90 levels boom I mean, some people were into speculating, but a lot of people just liked the comics in the 90s, too. Um, so that can't be discounted. People liked it. You know, let, let people like things, okay? Okay, I remember reading uh, reports at the time about a large amount of people who were not reading comics, just buying them as an investment. Sure, that happens. That happens in every kind of hobby. Um, and I think it is, it, it's just part of it. Like, again, if people enjoy collecting comics because of speculation or whatever... There's nothing you can do about that, right? This is this is the free market at work. All right, the com the the article continues. There were red flags raised about what would happen if the speculators suddenly left. What happened or that happened? Uh, the market once or took one heck of a hit and uh, a long time to recover. It did, and now a different kind of bubble has burst. It's the creative bubble, <laughs> uh, and people are they're tired of it. They want old comics. Okay, uh, Bleeding Cool continues. Now, decade later, decades later, comic publishers are trying to court speculators with variant covers. Yes, variant covers through comic shops. Uh, and in fact, in, in predatory practices for comic shops. Uh, to, you, have to, you have to order a certain amount, a certain quantity of those books so they can print so many in order for you to get those variant covers that everybody is hoping is going to be worth a lot of money. Um, now, I did hear that Dan DiDio uh, at uh, San Diego Comic-Con expressed some, I don't know, frustration <laughs> with this kind of scenario in wondering what it was that he's actually doing nowadays uh, now that he is so busy trying to push these kinds of comics. Um yeah, so let's uh, let's jump back in here. I still have tons of copies of Amazing Spider-Man number one from Dan Slott, Umberto Ramos from years ago. Yeah, I remember I was into that, like the Superior Spider-Man to Spider-Man one. Ended up just I I got tired of it. I I don't know. Dan Slott gets gets a little old for me. I, I stuck through it as much as I could, but I couldn't get through it anymore. <laughs> that's because yeah, it, it was just it was just too much. But that's beside the point. There were so many uh, variant covers that came from it. I remember those. there were cat variants even back then. They looked a little different than the ones you're getting today. But they still had van uh, cat variants. So he, basically, he is loaded <laughs> with these comics. And people are coming in not to buy new comics, but to buy old comics. Perhaps because 
the pricing is better. You know, if they're not getting special collectible comics that are actually worth some money, uh, but they can get comics that are worth very little and they're paying what they think comics are actually worth. Uh, and that can be a good thing. All right. He brings up Walmart as well, selling uh, DC comics and they're again doing reprints. I, I, this isn't a bad thing. This is good. Any way that you're getting comics to people and they're reading them, that is good. Hopefully you're reaching out to new readers. I'm only disappointed that it's taken this long for mainstream comics to do something to pull in new readers. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. I'm getting a little tired of this. This is actually a really wordy article, uh, but we're going to shift gears a little bit. This is, this is really, it is proof. This is proof that people like comics, that they want to read comics and really Generally speaking, the comics industry should not be built around uh, speculation and people trying to make a profit. That is a part that is sometimes a nice consequence, perhaps for retailers to be able to sell more. Possibly that could be a thing. Uh, there's also, you know, th there's there's a lot of benefits for people getting into that kind of stuff. But I compare this to Magic the Gathering because that's something I know a little bit about. And you see the same kind of a thing. There's this ecosystem with people that are purchasing these collectibles. The way that I look at comics is that you have a few different groups of people or different motivations for people that buy comics. And there is some overlap. One, you've got people that are there just to read the comics. They're actually enjoying the stories. They want to keep reading. Now, this group of people uh, has little patience for bad comics. Uh, they will follow a series until it gets dull, boring, or whatever, and then they're going to jump ship and get something else, or they'll move on to video games or some other kind of hobby that isn't going to do them wrong, <laughs> at least at the, in, for the time being. You have another group of people who are uh, there because they like the collectability. They're there for the covers. They're there because they want to fill up their long boxes or hang up art on the walls or whatever. And again, there's nothing wrong with this group of people. They're just motivated slightly differently. Now, can you have somebody that does both? Absolutely. Of course you can. Uh, you can also have another type of comic buyer. And I would say that type of buyer is somebody that is interested in the franchise and it might be the story. It might be the art, everything else. But let's say you love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I happen to. Uh, and so you're more likely to stick it through and keep buying those books through thick and thin, even when things get pretty rough, uh, in order to just follow this, these characters that you really love and you've loved for a long time. You, you just want to hold out hope that things will get better. So from my perspective, it'd be good to do things for all of these kinds of buyers, right? You don't want to do things that are only going to benefit the readers and that are totally going to ignore any collectors. Uh, why would you do that? People, again, are going to enjoy comics for a variety of reasons. So it's good, I think, to, to serve all those communities. Uh, and I bring up Magic the Gathering again, only because they use this type of thinking. And don't get me wrong, they do a lot of wrong uh, things when they're selling their cards and, and uh, you know getting their product out there. But something that I've always thought is a good idea is they have these archetypes of customers. Uh, I forget all the names. It's like Timmy, Johnny, Spike, something like that. And they're different kinds of customers that they sort of lump up into these categories that either are playing the game because they want to win. They're playing the game because they want to um, solve a puzzle and and do the most fancy combo that they can find um, or, you know, various other reasons. And so if you look at these kinds of archetypes, you would ask yourself when I'm releasing this product, what is in there for the Timmy? What is in there for the Johnny? Um, and you'd kind of go through it like that. Comics, I wish, would do the same kind of thing. They'd look at their customer base as a whole and not solely serve the collector and put all of their cash and you know all of their eggs in that one basket. That, I think, is where they're going wrong. It's not that they're doing variant covers, they're doing things that are collectible. It's that they're they're putting all those eggs in that basket. And because they're doing that, they're sacrificing story. They're confused about if readers are actually there to read the content between the cover and the back cover, right? You've got to be giving something to each of those kinds of customers. And if when you're making your product, you're thinking about those customers in that way, I think you're going to reach more people. 
So without further ado, I want to let you know about my comic book downcast. This has been a wild success on Indiegogo. We have 830 wonderful backers. We've reached $28,622. And if we reach $30,000, then we're going to have the amazing professional Eric Weathers do a trading card that all physical book backers will get uh, with their you know, with their purchase, with their book. So if you haven't backed it yet, check it out. It's in the link in the description below. I would be really, really appreciative of that. And I'll tell you, this is really opening the gateway for me for more projects because this has been such a great success. So please do get in. I don't think that you'll be disappointed. Thank you very much. And I will see you next time.